the book channel online. Hello, book lovers. I'm Stephanie Harris Byers, and welcome to the book channel online. Today, we have as our guest the best selling author, philosopher, and cultural theorist. Kwame Anthony Apia, author of The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity. Welcome, Kwame, to the Book Channel Online. Very good to be with you. Can you speak to the idea that conflict lies within identity? Every form of identity involves uh, assumptions, uh, stereotypes, pictures of what people are of a certain sort are like. They're uh, mistakes built into our notions of identity, mistakes about race, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, religion, and the like. That doesn't stop, however, those identities from being powerful, nor does it stop them from binding us together. You say that it's the root of global conflict. Tell us how do we combat that? So take one obvious example in the world today. The world today is riven by, by religious conflict between um, w both within Islam and between Islamists, that is between Islamists and other Muslims, and also between Islamists and the rest of us, we, we can't stop the, the, the fanatics, we can't stop the extremists, but we can make sure that we have good relations with, with the vast majority of ordinary, decent Muslims who are not trying to kill anybody, not trying to blow anybody up. And we can only do that if we have a proper understanding uh, about Islam, that we don't misrepresent Islam to ourselves, that we don't misunderstand it. So one of the chapters in the book is about is about religion and how I think people misunderstand the ways in which religious identities work. But these images are perpetuated constantly. So my task in, in when I'm writing about Islam, say, is, is first of all to, to tell the truth about Islam, not to misrepresent it. Um, and, and I think Islam is co com constantly and commonly misrepresented. But I think the one of the reasons why it's misrepresented is because there's a deeper misunderstanding about the nature of religious identities in general. Um, so what about in that chapter is the fact that people are constantly quoting little bits of the Quran and saying, well, how can we deal with people who, who um, agree with that? But that isn't something people only do with Muslims. They, uh, atheists do it with Christians. They point to passages in the Bible that no modern Christian would endorse. And they say, well, how can you deal with someone who, 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 who you know, has a book that says that? The books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, the, uh, the Jewish Torah, contain many uh, invitations, for example, to kill various people. Uh, it involves, it, it, it talks about stoning adulterers to death. Um, I'm, as far as I'm aware, no modern Christian, uh, indeed very few ancient Christians, have ever stoned anyone to death, even though it says so in the Old Testament. People who actually live with religious texts understand that they have to interpret them, that they have to make them suitable to the times and the places in which they're living and so on, which is why Christians don't stone people to death and why Jews don't stone people to death. So, so, why, should we so why should we expect Muslims to be any different from Christians and Jews? So it's a contextual issue then. It's a bad idea always, I think, to think you can do a better job of interpreting someone's scriptures than they can. <laughs> it's a bad idea to assume that you can, you can catch somebody out uh, by pointing to something in their scriptures. Because, as I say, it, people have ways of dealing with these things. There are many different explanations, no doubt, for why um, uh, modern Christians don't believe in stoning adulterers. Uh, one reason is that it says, that Christ says in the New Testament, uh, when presented with a woman taken in adultery, what Christ says is, um, who, who's without sin, who can, who, let, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, of course, if you understand um, the New Testament, you know that Christ thinks nobody's without sin, and so there's nobody to do the stoning. Uh, and then he says, well, if there's nobody here without sin to do the stoning, why don't we let her go away? And he, and he forgives her. He doesn't say in that passage that he's rejecting the law of Moses. He just says about this particular person, um, you know, that she should be let go. In order to know that, you have to know more than just that one tiny passage uh, in the in the Old Testament. You have to know about the to know about, and that's the sort of thing that people, when they're criticizing Islam, tend not to do. They tend to pick this one passage, and you say to them, "Do you know about these other passages? Do you know what the practices of Muslims over the centuries in this matter?" 
uh, those are relevant too. So yes, there are lots of places where I think um, identity leads us astray. African-American thoughts on how we view ourselves. I think that some of the things that, that nevertheless are widely shared among African-Americans uh, about identity is a sense that, um, that for example, uh, we are all because of the history of racism. And you can't be sure if you're a black person in this country that you won't be exposed to it. So there's something that African-Americans all know, black Americans all know. They know that there's a risk that uh, in the wrong context, um, racism will continue to be a problem for them. And so they know, we know that we have a share in dealing with that problem and dealing together with um, racism. Uh, but still, there, there is, I think, a widespread agreement among African-Americans that because of this racist history, that there's something that needs doing about that and that probably we have to do it. Uh, it won't work if we're the only people doing it, and yellow people and brown people uh, to participate in the process of making our country less racist too. But, uh, but we, uh, we have taken the lead historically, and I think, um, and we'll continue to do so. Why this book now? The main reason is, is, is that I, I was asked to think about these things to do a, to do a, a few years ago, and this is how long it took me to get, to get it done. But I think this book is, I mean, that's the historical answer. But the fact is, at the moment in our country, in these United States, we face a huge set of problems uh, around uh, racial identity, around uh, not just not just black identity, but now white identity politics, um, dangerous kind, I think. Uh, we have problems uh, in relation to the Hispanic and Latin American identities, which we see in the way people have been treated at our borders, our southern border recently. And um, I mentioned the, the Islam and the problem of the division in the world between the all of these are problems that have, I'm afraid, been exacerbated in the last couple of years by, by a president who is himself um, uh, quite uh, willing, whatever his own sentiments, quite willing to draw on racism, sexism, and Islamophobia and hostility to, to pursue his, his agenda. Continued success in your writing, and I'd like to thank you for watching the book channel online. You can buy The Lies That Bind on QBR.com through our affiliate partnership with Amazon. I'm Stephanie Harris Byers. Watch us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. As the pages turn, we'll on the book channel online. The book channel online.